Hello, Sophia. Hello, Eric. How are you guys? Hello, we're great. Hello, thanks for having us. We're doing really well. Uh, I was telling Sophia because it's uh, you, the one I contacted when we were organizing the whole podcast, that you are the first um, fully Swedish uh, guests on the podcast because um, we have had um, one guy, uh, Jonas um, Schaumann, who is um, um, no Jonas Nor Norgren and um, Schaumann. He there one Swedish and uh, one Finnish, but they're based in Denmark. Um, so, um, you're the first fully Swedish guests on the podcast and I'm, I really like it. Wow. It's so international. What's an honor. What an honor. <laughs> um, you guys have a really cool, uh, product and software and platform. I don't know how to call it. So maybe it's better that you introduce a little bit what you do and what is it about? Yeah. So basically it's a, it's a platform. It's a web-based platform where, Property developers and architects can run generative design and parametric design scripts in the cloud. So it's basically a way for for to make parametric and generative design more accessible to more people um, through through making it um, easier to interact with, basically. Mm -hmm. And and for those of you who, who maybe don't know what what generative design is and what parametric design is, it's a way of doing. Um, in our case, architecture and buildings, but with code and algorithms. So we are big fans of algorithms and programming, but we code the logic behind how to create a building in early stages. And we publish that in the web, in the platform, so that people can play around with it and explore different uh, uh, options of buildings so to say yes when i saw your platform and um i saw it through linkedin and then i went to the website i do this routine where when i see something interesting i i, I go stalk the different <laughs> websites on online um so i was wondering and my personal opinion as an architect it's that the future of architecture and the future of um this building environment is more integration with technology not only in the process but also within the domotics and all the 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 technology we use um i was wondering how did you manage to gather the knowledge that you need from the field of architecture so um you guys have some architectural background and also the information technology uh, background, which it's to build the code that executes what your platform does. So could you tell more about how did you find these skills and combine them together? Yeah, of course. So as you mentioned, we both have backgrounds as architects. I've been studying architecture for over five years and we did the bachelor together. So we studied architecture and engineering um, so, of course, we have some skills from, from the architectural field, um, but during our spare time, we also spend a lot of time with programming. Uh, I've never studied IT or I've never studied programming, but I, I did this in my spare time. And when I saw these two like fields, um, things started to happen and we were like, maybe we can combine these two worlds. and when we do that it's not that we have the final answer for how to do everything from the beginning but we started in a really small scale and then things just happened so we built one piece and then we built another and we didn't have all of the knowledge from the beginning we yeah yeah i guess we had like an initial idea for what we wanted to do so like you mentioned Sophia, i also have a background in architecture it actually shows to <clears throat> go into more more like data science and engineering for my masters because uh, I really felt like that connection between the the um, uh, the building and like the visualization of, of buildings uh, and also like on, on one hand and also on the other hand more like the the data and the information behind what's being built and what's being drawn uh, that there is really really important and strong connection between those and um, I think that was like the initial idea that we had and then kind of just like built from there. Mm. Um, and we've added like a lot of knowledge and gained a lot of knowledge on the way. So we built one piece and then we were like, oh, now we can do it like this. And if we do it like that, we can add this feature and this uh, knowledge into the platform. So 
we didn't really have all of the answers from from scratch mm. but we started with one thing and sometimes things just happen one more really important aspect is like the interaction with people uh, within the industry like the people that actually uses the product and that gives us feedback mm. and new ideas and like how to mm. proceed the um, the journey <laughs> Yeah, that is probably the most important step, like getting feedback from people with a lot of experience. Mm. And yeah, it's uh, fantastic what you were saying, and um, I'm um, very impressed by your intuition, so to say. Um, and I want to go more in detail. And you mentioned it's um, startup method, which is building this little MVP, this uh, minimal product, and then get feedback and then go back on the on the drawing table and build upon and so to say to bring this uh, natural evolution made of this loop um what were the first pieces of of this uh this intuition and this uh this platform and what were the first um goals and i'm curious when you started with the first pieces did you had already in the background sort of a vision what could become or you started really focusing uh, by following the first small goal and then moving on the next small goal and now it's this online cloud-based platform i think we had a really clear vision but that vision was something else than the vision that we have today <laughs> so it was a yeah. vision but another vision I mean, when, when we when we start doing things, we had so many ideas and inspiration in the beginning and we didn't really see the complexity and we didn't see the real challenge with doing it. And we had one vision of what we thought it would be, but when we started it and when we get feedback, got feedback from people, it turned out to be something slightly different, but almost the same. What 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 was the initial vision? What was that initial vision? I think we were very optimistic with what the platform, what the platform and the technology could do. We were like, okay, we're just pressing a button, and bam, you have buildings, and the prop, the platform, and the technology will solve everything, which is not it's really not, the, case. the case. No, but I think like most <clears throat> like most good ideas, like. It, it usually comes from that you have you, you see an issue yourself and you want to you kind of know in the back of your head that there must be a better way of doing this than than what we're doing at the moment but you, you don't really know you know kind of like you have a you have a picture or like an initial idea of what that solution could look like but it's blurred so you, you don't really know the uh, the exact uh, high rendered uh, uh, picture of exactly what the solution should look like and then you like you try to go a little bit closer to the what you think it might be and then you start to see more details in the picture and you, you go for maybe one or two of the details and you and like it's it leads you into the next step and then and uh, yeah it get the complexity grows as mm -hmm. you go as well mm -hmm. so, i mean the more you know about one thing the more you realize how much you don't know about mm -hmm. it mm -hmm. so what so. was so what was the first version of it what was the first uh sort of you got this idea that you want to build this platform that will be very uh, autonomous, so to say, and do things way better than, than for example, a single person could do. Um, and what was your first product that you generated out of it or concept or prototype? Yeah, okay. The first product was quite scattered. I mean, we, we developed a lot of different isolated uh, features so uh, for, for those of you who work with parametric design and visual programming probably knows about Grasshopper. So we started to do prototyping in Grasshopper and we realized it's a super powerful tool and it's amazing. We, we love Grasshopper and Rhino, um, but people without knowledge in these programs, they don't know how to use it. So we did the studies and the scripts in Grasshopper, but then we, uh, took pictures of everything that we generated. So we generated one alternative, we took a picture of it and saved the data. We generated another one, took a picture, and then we published the pictures um, on the web together with some output data. So it was kind of the same idea with generating options, but we did a lot of stuff manually in the background that yeah. no one saw. So it's almost like we, we automated something, but 
in the end, it turned out to be more job with the automation than it was to just do it the manual way. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? So and, basically, um, basically, there were people coming to you asking to get um, this parametric um, analysis, and mm -hmm. you had created some sort of scripts that could do it and should have been applied for, for every single case. Exactly. Yeah. So you can see it a lot like a scenario study, for example. So people came to us and they were like, okay, I have this design case. I would like to explore maybe a few concepts that could be possible for me to do. And I would like to see what the differences are between concept A, B, and C, for example. And we started to build scripts for these concepts. It could be like, you have a plot and you would like to try out different volumetric uh, proposals, let's say. Um, so we wrote scripts for that. We placed the buildings on, on a site and tried out different configurations. Um, and then we took pictures and saved all of, uh, all of the data. So it looked like an automated process, but for us, it was uh, still a lot of manual work in the background. Yeah, it was like you, you spend 20 hours writing a script and then you spend 80 hours running the script for, for different cases. Mm. And we realized that we need to cut cut the 80 hours away if it's yeah, if we're actually sure. going to be able to do it for, for more people. And this is where this problem for you. So basically you were running sort of a service for, for people and you decided, okay, this should be switched from being a service to being a product, which is uh, mm -hmm. a digital product, which um, companies can can go um, and use by themselves, more or less, with probably a little bit of your feedback or help if they don't go through the the interface or if they don't know what inputs to 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 set up. Um, but I have some basic knowledge of. Um, of Grasshopper and uh, visual uh, visual programming, or do you use these sort of cards and these visual connections um, in um, in Grasshopper, which it's still complicated but way simpler than coding. Um, mm -hmm. Did you need to improve way much your coding skills to integrate these Grasshopper functions, or is there some so, so how what was the process from there okay you have the problem with the eight hours that you want to save yeah. <laughs> what was the process from there <laughs> yeah so we started out with in grasshopper basically uh, and we did one script but you know what it could look like when you start adding components and sometimes you have I don't know, but hundreds of components and there's so many wires and it looks like a mess of spaghetti and you're like if you leave it for a week and you come back, it's like, what have I done in the script? <laughs> and so we were starting thinking about how can we reuse the components? How can we modular, like create modules of uh, components that we, uh, that we use a lot of times? Um, so we moved on to C-sharp and we rewrote the, uh, the components in C-sharp so that the canvas is cleaner and we can reuse the components in each and every uh, script that we create. So step number two was moving into Visual Studio and uh, C Sharp. Yeah, so it takes like, an, initially it takes a longer time, but in the long run, um, it's much more time efficient because you, you, you do something one time instead of redoing the same thing over and over again. Mm. Um, yeah, and I mean, the coding skills, like it, it's, a, it's a process going from not knowing how to code to, to knowing a little bit of, how to code and we're, I mean we're still learning we're still not not uh, experts in any any um, way but um, I think experts we're in doing uh, all of the tasks at the same time yeah yes I mean, exactly I guess that's our main expertise <laughs> so basically to to see if I understood it right uh, it was taking the big spaghetti mess split it in smaller spaghetti messes which you can use to build the spaghetti mess you need <laughs> if we want to use yes. the exactly, yeah, exactly, spaghetti exactly. mess analogy. Cutting up the spaghetti. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And also, like, so when we, when we started to create this script, so we sent it to people and we, we asked them to run it, it's also kind of like disencouraging when you, when you see that big mess of spaghetti and you don't really know how to, 
where to start or like what uh, what component to move or what uh, wire to to use or whatever. Um, so it's also about like um, when you when you feel like you understand something and something is intuitive and easy to use, then you're also more encouraged to actually start using it and and like being more interested in wanting to know more about what can be done. Uh, so it's also a lot about like getting people on board and and um, yeah, helping people to take that first initial step into thinking that this is something that's interesting. Mm. Let's explore more. At uh, what point of your life or what um, age did you start uh, doing this thing? Because um, also in the um, every innovation or innovative uh, product, so to say, or trying to innovate something, there is always this, uh, you know, the, the myth that... Uh, startuppers or these uh, tech uh, junkies are always very young and um, I'm curious that uh, because um, also when when you're young and uh, you want to go to design school um, you learn these things but they're very abstract and out of contest and at least I don't know how was your case uh, where you have studied and in Sweden how it is but in general, I've studied in Italy and Germany, and you learn these abstract concepts that solve design problems. But you, if you don't have yourself some very in, innate, for example, um, mm-hmm. entrepreneurship, then you don't see application uh, for commercial use, so to say. Not, not so, not in this way that you you taught it. So, at mm-hmm. what point did you started doing this? Um, uh, grasshopper um, consultation so to say and uh, yeah when did you start the whole idea what age or what stage of your life um, I I was not super young I was still young but uh, I mean for me it was a little bit of a, I started in the opposite direction I started with uh, mechanical engineering actually so I started to study that uh, but then I realized I missed the creative part of that education. It was a really good education, but I wanted the more abstract concepts, as you talked about. So uh, I found the education architecture and engineering, and I thought this is a perfect mix because I will get both the tech side and also the abstract concepts. And so I started there and got to both do very, like, realistic stuff when it comes to technology and calculating stuff and do the tech parts. Um, But I also got a lot from the abstract thinking and the way of actually challenging how things are. Um, Because at mechanical engineering, for example, we got a task and we were supposed to solve that task. But at the architectural school, we were like, but why is it like this? Can we try out other things? So I think that studying architecture also um, kind of forced me to to challenge uh, why things are uh, as they are for example yeah for me i think i've always been like a mathematician at, at heart or at birth mm-hmm. and then like the the whole creative part is something that i think it's something that always like interested me so i, I think i i wanted to pursue it but um, i wasn't sure how how good i was at it um, but then I, I think I found like a golden middle way where I can both be creative and also do mathy and, and nerdy stuff. And the whole the whole like entrepreneur part, I think that's also something that that just comes naturally. Like I, I don't really see myself as an entrepreneur in that sense. It's more just or us. But it's, mm-hmm. it's more like you just want to do something and you want to pursue what you think can be beneficial for, for the industry and you have an idea that you believe in. And when you pursue that, you like automatic, automatically have to also start become an entrepreneur, right? Mm-hmm. Or that's kind of the definition. So it's it's more about like just wanting to do something and then, then everything else just follows along. And also I think it's uh, quite a lot of similarities between doing creative stuff when it comes to building design, being creative in, in writing code and also running a company. It's more like the mindset of, creativity and how to uh, look at things instead of just doing things as they should be done you kind of think a little bit about what if we do it in another way does it have to be done like this you kind of 
uh, train yourself to challenge the way you think. Challenge status quo. Mm. Sounds like a cliche, but <laughs> <laughs> it is true. It's true. Yeah. No, but so some of some. Building some of, company. <laughs> yeah, some of these cliches are uh, end up being true. And uh, but let's say you were like beginning in mid twenties, so to say, because if you yeah. have started yeah. something else, and of course you said yourself you had a very strong uh, mathematical, logical, and computational background already that you um, enhanced with architecture, and mm. that gave fruits to to this uh, this combination. So it was like a natural fusion of the two skills. Yeah, yeah it's actually quite interesting because like when I, when I went to architecture school, I, I sometimes felt a little bit like, not that I didn't fit in, but that I didn't really understand all of the concepts that I had a hard time comprehending some of the, like the, the way of thinking. Um, not always, but sometimes. But now I feel like I, I actually found a place where I can, where I can, I can do architecture, but I can do it in my, my own way or like a way that, suits me really well so and um so to go back to the for example the 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 timeline of of the of the platform so you have uh f- that done the first couple of operation of of sort of sort of uh streamlining your process uh first within grasshopper and um when did you and how did you start it um translating this ideas these um, different uh, small uh, combinations in code did you need did you have already enough skills to do that or did you need to extra learn or extra get consultation from someone that was from that field exactly it was a combination i would say we had some basic knowledge about it um but we didn't know everything because um, we didn't know about server architecture and how to do like backend development. We we knew a little bit of JavaScript. We knew a bit yeah. a bit of HTML and CSS, and uh, we were like, we need to bring what we've done. We need to scale it up, and we need to do that in the web because that's where people will use it. Because we also wanted to scale up um, and make parametric and generative design accessible for people without. Um, knowledge in visual programming and if you don't have knowledge in that you probably don't have Rhino and Grasshopper installed on your computer so we're like we need to take that into the web and that kind of forced us to learn web development. Yeah, I guess you could say that we, we, we didn't know how to do it but we kind of knew enough that we could specify roughly for ourselves what needed to be done mm-hmm. like what like really rough outline of what what steps need to be taken to to get to to like a first working um, MVP. Mm, yeah, we knew what we needed to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah. Mm. But of course, we, we couldn't do it all ourselves. So we, I, I know my cousin, he knew someone who was working in web development and he knew another guy. So we were like starting to do some research and we found two super good guys in back end development. So we're now a team of four people doing this together and then yeah. the same uh, yes yeah, sorry Go ahead. no i wanted to say that it's funny what you said because in the last episode i had um, a guy drawing on Schendel. he's a professor at the e um, ie university in barcelona and he focused on business for architecture and um mm-hmm. they they try to you know exactly teach uh, students how to combine architecture with these other fields and he was saying that when you're working on a project um it's like um it's the same like when you buy a car and then you start seeing all the people with the same car in the sense that uh when you work in the field and when you try to learn something somehow you get in touch with people so that was a natural (laughs) natural um so to say meeting the right people um one thing that it always uh, has been interesting for me in the um, especially in europe because the most famous stories of uh, tech startups or the most successful uh, tech startups um, some of them are from sweden like spotify but um 
how do you uh, how did you manage this period of time where you needed to experiment a lot without a clear uh i mean with a goal but without a clear certainty of outcome uh i mean we are all people and in the end of the day we have to bring up food to the table and pay the rent or the mortgage or whatever we have to pay um so uh, how were you sustaining yourself and did you try to find at some point was there a point uh, where you tried to find some venture capital or somebody investing in you even if it's a kickstart online program mm -hmm. We actually started out as consultants. So that is uh, the main reason how we could uh, manage this. So we didn't really start from scratch. It was not like we didn't do anything within this field at all from the beginning. Um, so we already had the clients. We already had a lot of uh, projects going on and, and we were paid by hour. So that's how we, how we started. And then on our spare time, we started to develop the platform, mainly also for, for uh, automating our own work. Yeah. And in the beginning, like when we actually started, we were still both students. Mm. Um, so we were like, we were, we were studying and then we were doing consultancy on top of that. And then we were doing um, like a platform, starting with a platform on our spare time on top of that. So it was a really busy period of time. Um, But yeah, it, I mean, it's super tough to bootstrap. Um, so, at least in, in the like in the very beginning, yeah. um, it gets better. Mm. And um, how was? But also, like to get at a point where you're consulting companies and um, you have to pitch yourself, so to say. Um, mm. How was it to pitch yourself as a student to go to several architecture offices and say? Here I'm a still a student, but I can be your expert in computational design. Did you pitch with a portfolio, or did you have did you know again people that worked actually in 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 the offices? <laughs> I would say both, but in the beginning it was super hard. Like since we were both students, we were like, "Are we really experts?" And you doubt a bit. Yeah. You think that if you've been working at an architectural firm, you have to know so much more than we know because we're still students. But then you, after you've done it like several times, you realize that we are quite good in this. And apparently we are experts, even though we are students and even though we're young. Um, people appreciate the work that we do and uh, it's getting better and better. Yeah, it's super scary in the beginning, but after a while you, you learn to, to not uh, present yourself as a student mm. in, in the first, I mean, you can say that you're a student, but it's not your primary um, feature. Like you, you know a lot of stuff and you can do a lot of stuff. So you're not just a student, you're a person studying, right? Mm. So, uh, but it takes some courage to, to, to start. Yeah. Believe it, I mean, the first person <laughs> you need to convince is yourself, right? Um, And once you're done with that part, then you need to convince everybody else. Um, so, but convincing yourself could sometimes yeah, be like the, hardest the hardest part, part in it because you're like, but am I really an expert in this? There must be some other people that are much more competent in in the field of computational design, and of course there is. But uh, yeah. like doing the combination, and you you get an expert in what you do, so. And truth is like the convincing yourself part is like an ongoing process. So it's not like you're, you go, you, you go to a certain point and then you're like, you're done, you know that this is, will work, but it's something that you need to continue working with all the time. Like, mm -hmm. okay, you never be done. <laughs> now you won't be done with that part. Just, uh, just mm. hang in there. And I, I think like, if you see that there is a need for something and that yourself Want, want to have that thing then then I think it's much easier to convince mm -hmm. yourself that you're actually on the right track yeah and so also very, I mean oh, sorry <laughs> no no um, I want to say also you had the advantage that you both uh, were like even uh, by combining each other by having the knowledge of the other mind so to say because yeah. one expert it's good but two experts together maybe one knows one yeah. thing <laughs> yes yeah, it's also also much easier to convince yourself uh, when, when you have someone else to like um yeah like just brainstorm ideas with and and some i mean yeah always you have 
or sometimes you have bad days and then you can you can mm. get a little bit of energy from the other person and the other way around so mm. it makes it much easier yeah much much easier i'm curious um, it would be fun to do this kind of stuff alone at all mm. i mean the team part is what's making this happen mm. I'm curious uh, where you the the um, the only two people or like is it very let's put it in the other way is it uh, was it very uh, promoted this um, this um, education of into parametric design at your university or you were like the two um only so to say or few, from some of the few experts in grasshopper because at the university where i studied if somebody was really good at grasshopper it would be a famous person <laughs> within the university <laughs> because everybody would be like he knows grasshopper or she knows grasshopper, grasshopper girl. <laughs> uh, yeah they will be like when they pass by everybody would be like oh my god you're a superstar <laughs> well, well <It's> that guy. <laughs> i wish it was like that <laughs> no but uh, no i wouldn't say so um i mean we we studied the mix between architecture and engineering so in our program it was i think people really appreciated grasshopper and the mix between architecture and technology i think it has more to do with like interest than than maybe like um, specific um competence or because like when you're interested in something then you start spending time doing that thing and then you get good at it after a while mm. um, so it's it's just about the hours i think and mm. I, i didn't i don't think i even used grasshopper during my my part like when i was actually studying architecture i used it like a couple of times maybe uh, but i thought it was really interesting so. but that was the thing because when we used grasshopper in school and when we did it during the education my opinion was that we didn't really use it for um traditional projects we used it for very like specific projects such as grid shells or very complicated geometries so i think people when they hear parametric design and when people hear um, grasshopper they automatically think about sahadid buildings or uh, very very complex uh, geometrical shapes but we were like but we can use the technology but we can use it for housing development and we can use it on floor plans and more like traditional um traditional projects um so i also think that the tools are super powerful but i think that a lot of people still um think about sahadid buildings when they hear mm. uh, grasshopper and parametric design but to us mm. it could be so much more It's um, curious because I've said this on other past episodes that um, I I work in the industry and I know how traditional architecture is done. And for example, one of the reasons why you have the regular floor, so to say, of a building is because it's cheaper to build the same floor all over the building mm -hmm. because you design one and you just basically... Uh, extruded uh, upstairs <laughs> yes yeah. uh, and um, I went to one convention in Munich about it was before the the whole problem we currently have to deal with um, in in um, in Munich and uh, there was one of the partners of MVRDV and they presented uh, one of their super pixelated projects uh, and it was a um, Uh, living livings like flats and i asked the the question how do you manage to do so many different floors and they mm -hmm. said well we have a script that actually makes the, the floor plans mm -hmm. for us and that was kind of scary for me because i was like okay that means that sooner or later we won't be me needed or we won't be needed as so many as we are now a lot of people mm -hmm. will get their job uh, killed so As somebody that's uh, now an expert in the field and have um, created these um, tools, what is your um, vision on the future of uh, architecture and the architect as a profession? Um, BIM softwares, CAD softwares, 
have already killed a lot of jobs. We have these pictures of back in the days when there were all these drafters in these huge holes throwing every single piece of um, the building. And slowly with digitalization, this shrunk. Are we expecting it to be shrinking even further on in the next um, five to 10 years? I don't think we will like kill the jobs, but I definitely think we will shift focus. Um, I mean, there is still a lot of repetitive tasks in doing architecture. And I mean, architecture is a super broad uh, scope. You can work with a lot of different things within architecture. Um, so it's about taking out the repetitive tasks. And we always talk about how do we see this? Is it like an evil robot stealing our jobs? Or should we see it more like a did good to have digital system trying to like enable us to do even better things and focus on, on quality, focusing on sustainability aspects and other things. So I don't think it will kill the jobs, but I definitely think it will, uh, uh, we will shift focus. And that's a nice, are, so, nice so way to yeah, so the, the architects are, are, are best at doing good architecture. So we, we basically see it as, and right now it's, it's I mean, as an architect, you of course you do architecture, but it's also a lot of number crunching and like trying to make, squeezing that extra parking space to make it actually work. So if we can like get rid of the amount of time that people spend on those kind of tasks and actually like focus on what creates value and what creates nice and vivid, buildings and cities, then I think we, we gain a lot probably. Mm -hmm. And maybe we'll take more people in the future. Maybe we'll take fewer people in the mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. um, but also the society and the whole environment in general is also cha constantly changing. And we live in a world where the requirements are getting more and more, it's getting more and more complex to design we have a lot of parameters and aspects to take into consideration every time. So we need new tools and we, as a profession, also need to, to shift focus because the world around us is doing the same. So we, can, we cannot continue as we do forever. So, yeah. But even if like a machine is, is doing something, so I mean, a machine is always doing in one, one sense or another, like what you tell it to do, right? So even though you've like automated the process, you still need to um, you need to ha have people to tell the machine what to automate. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, I think that just like you said, Sophia, that the maybe the role of the architect will shift a little bit. Maybe it will be more like an analytical role in the future and more more focused on like the describing the the logic behind the, uh, the design. Um, but I, I I don't think we ever will will. Um, yeah lose the, the role of the architect because it's it's too important me neither and i think it, we're getting more and more convinced about that when we're working with the things that we're doing because as we mentioned in the beginning when we talked about what vision we had when we started the company i think we both had not the vision of getting rid of the architect of course of course not but i think we had a very high vision with or about what the technology could do and of course, technology is super powerful, but it's not powerful without the humans in the loop. Yeah, it's a combination that, that actually creates the, uh, the value or, mm. you know. So it's a very, very important combination. And without the architects in the loop, it's not going to be good. <laughs> so I think we're shifting focus and we're, um, Maybe their new roles will appear, but I definitely don't think that we will <laughs> we will kill or get rid of the jobs. Uh, we'll see. I don't know. They're getting a lot of uh, very powerful um, AI systems. Like, for example, I think about the cars that, um, mm. in my opinion, the cars that will be driveless will be uh, in mass scale where sooner here than... than um, than people actually expect and um also i think for example it's um uh, now all over the world or all, especially in europe there is this um lack of uh, truck drivers for example and i think this is sort of a sign that 
uh this job it's uh you know outdated and probably soon it will be like before there were people that were driving elevators so later there won't be even people driving cars and trucks um mm-hmm. but to go back to to the current situation of your of your platform uh so basically your job was to bring on this cloud based platform the features of rhino and grasshopper and also generate another uh how to say it, interface for the user that actually has a surface that looks differently but in the background runs that functions that rhino and grasshopper has is did i understood correctly yes no, it's already 100%. Good. <laughs> yeah <laughs> really good description. We usually, we usually um, uh, uh, compare it to like a, like a tape player. Um, like a know, what player? Like, like a tape player, you know, like one of the old uh, 90s Walkman players. And you can, uh, so it's like a wrapper and you can, you can put in different cassette tapes, different design logics into it and you can play them from the web. Uh, but you can, you have the same player for, for all the tapes, but you can, you can def- define your own your own mixtape, so to speak, like your own way of designing something and plug it in and you can, you can run it. Mm. So we see it as like, we have grasshopper files, but if we put it in the, in the player or the cassette player, we can run the grasshopper scripts in, in a sequence, for example, and we can combine them in different ways. And we can mo- like work in a modular way with grasshopper and put that into the cassette player. <laughs> Uh, yeah, maybe it's like mixing music, but you mix, um, so to say, building because, recipes. <laughs> because cassette cassettes are very um, rigid, but maybe it's like uh, getting different tracks, MP3 tracks, and yeah, yeah, uh, exactly. yeah. mix them, mixtape. Or like a playlist on Spotify. <laughs> yes, <laughs> to make it more <laughs> Swedish. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. <laughs> No, that sounds like a very cool idea, and um, I, I, I like. I want to disclaim that I haven't been paid for for from you to make uh, any sort of commercial to it, or I have never used it. I just, um, I just uh, to today at some point I was going through the website because uh, this is my preparation. The day of the interview, I go to the website and <laughs> and um, go through and there was uh, there were a few images how it works and you can get a demo version. Uh, so I'll go through with the things that I didn't understand. So as far as understood, the first step of the process in like, let's not get in the technicality how you have built it because probably it's going to be a very long explanation and it's going to be complicated but the end result is that you have made it so now there is the platform and uh, the first step is to pick the site right the the location Mm -hmm. of the building Uh, is this connected then to google maps or how do you pick the location because uh or is it a limited or do you or do you set up like do you insert for example the coordinates or how it works it is uh based on OpenStreetMap. So it's basic, to yeah, OpenStreetMap. And you, mm-hmm. you can pick the lot. And um, then the second um, step was to your building, I think it was. And that was my, my question is, do you upload your file or can you generate the building within the platform? That is the idea. You, you generate the building with a platform. So you specify what kind of building you would like to, uh, what you, what, which building you would like to build, basically. Because what we realized is that the design logic differs a lot depending on what kind of building you would like to do. If you're doing residential development in a city center, there's one logic behind that. And if you're doing mixed use, there's another logic behind that. Or if you're doing a smaller scale or in a master plan scale, there's a different logic behind that. So you can see it more like a hub where we write scripts for these different um, project types and we put them into the web. 
So you as a user can go in, you pick the logs, and then you select, oh, I want to try out the master plan script for this one. And you I, pick that one, and you try out the study. Um, and you get a lot of variations for, um, for, for that specific design logic. And also when you go into like more, more detailed stuff like um, modular construction, for example, where you have like, you have a certain set of modules that you, that you uh, use as a basis for your building, then you can, you can also, of course, uh, if you take it one step further, like um, use those buildings and the design logic with, um, with how you can combine those modules uh, to create like a custom script or custom design logic. Um, which is tailored to, to that specific logic or way of building. So the first uh, the, the first thing that the platform does is generates shapes from for you, but is it pure volumes or is it already with a, so to say, thinking about the entire subdivision of the building? Like for example, if you're doing a apartment building, is it just vol volumes? Or is it just? Um, it's all uh, the way down to the apartments. Okay. Yeah. But how how many combination can the software create, and how many parameters can you? For instance, if I am Saha Adit and I want to use your platform, is it mm -hmm. more for like the rather traditional use or in traditional? buildings or can i generate also any anything you i think you say it very well sometimes because like everything you can do in grasshopper you can do the same kind of thing here yes it, it, i mean all all that it really is is a wrapper for grasshopper so everything that can be done in grasshopper can be done on the platform as well it's just it's just a way of um like making grasshopper more accessible and making it easier for more people to use to use the design logic through through this interface mm -hmm. and to get rid of the uh, call the spaghetti dilemma that you you have these super complicated scripts, but mm -hmm. then in like so that's the in theory you could do everything. But I think our focus with the parametric solutions is to, to focus on more traditional buildings mm -hmm. and like the uh, like pro like projects that are regular projects basically mm -hmm. residential and and uh, commercial. Projects, but it, hello, the regular stuff that are being built. Oh, you um, were you were gone for a second. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, no, sorry. no, no. But but I understood everything. You you just for a <laughs> second I thought you were completely done, but you're still there. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no, no. All good. Um, no, it sounds uh, it sounds uh, great. Uh, probably I should. Um, go on the website and try the demo version so that um, I can understand um, better. And then after that, you can do everything you can do within a grasshopper. And can you then in the end pull down the building from the cloud to your computer? Like in the end, can you just download the, the building or how it works in the end? Yes, at the moment we have a file export, uh, so we are exporting it to an OBJ file that you then later on can import to a Rhino or any other CAD program. But we will, in the near future, uh, create some kind of adapter that you can push and pull building information back and forth. But at the moment we are doing um, file exports. What, what do you mean by that final thing that you said? I didn't understand. Like you will be able to access. Oh, you mean, no. you mean the adapter stuff or? No, I mean the, like, so if I am a client of yours, I go mm. and I use your product and I create this building. And mm. then in the end, I have this design that it was held by your tool, but it's like my design. Um, mm -hmm. But your platform, it's cloud-based. So maybe I want just to keep my my building somewhere as a model, as a sketch. Um, mm -hmm. Do I just download download the file? Um, and yeah. how this will so, change in the future? As you mentioned, something might be changing in the future. All right, all right. So at the moment, you have the possibility to download uh, download the file. So if you find an option that you think, okay, this is a great option. I want to continue working with this one press download 
and you will get a file that you can open up in Rhino um, or in other CAD programs as well. Um, but we are looking into other solutions that will come in the near future, uh, which is um, not file-based, but you can push and pull uh, data. I don't know how to explain mm. it. Yeah, um, so basically the problem right now is like, if you if you export something from the platform, it's the attached from the platform, right? So it kind of like, it still has a value because you, you have still compared it to other solutions or options. But once you download it, then, then it's the attached, right? Uh, but what we want to create is more like something closer to like a live link, so you can you can you can work wow. with it and mm -hmm. like still have it in comparison with all, all the other options and like uh, extend the period for for where it can live in the cloud. Yes. Um, so currently, the problem is once you get it out, it's not going to yeah, be able can... to be. You cannot put it back in, so you have to start from scratch. Yeah. I understand. No, uh, oh, well, <laughs> you don't need to start from scratch, but let's say you generate uh, 10 options mm -hmm. and you think number eight is uh, perfect. So you download number eight, you bring it into Rhino and you start modifying it in Rhino. Then it's like outside the cloud environment. I see. Okay, now I get it. Like and you modify. probably lower one part of the building and higher another part. And you're back at the traditional way of, of designing but you cannot use the platform to see, okay, what happened with that alternative? Did the square meter, what did we gain more square meters? Did we lose square meters? Uh, is it more energy efficient or less energy efficient? Because it's outside the platform. So we're thinking about some kind of live link where you can actually start with the generated options and then modify them in, in other programs, but then see. see live, how does my design uh, relate to the generated options and how can I decide together with the proposed uh, proposed alternatives for, from the AI and from the platform if that makes sense so I'm gonna say it like this it's it it sounds like a next step for yeah. what is now Rhino inside so you want to do some yeah. I, I imagine it like a live connection which is on your maybe within a software i would say can be rhino can be revit can be whatever hmm. and uh and um you basically can still see change in both softwares like in the software you can change it and then the platform can understand or other way or vice versa and then at some point bake it what is the language for yeah, exactly. yes, yes, for yes. A grasshopper <laughs> Great. So, Thanks. yeah exactly yeah it, it, it's 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 a really good analogy actually yes uh, when you bake something it, it's it's out there right because you want to keep the link yes i understand i uh i understand the logic behind it and i think it's it's brilliant i think it's um um yeah i i, I think that if somebody I don't know if guys they know about your existence already because I'm wondering how nobody of these big big companies haven't come to you and said we want to buy the whole thing <laughs> and you develop it within because <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe they have come hasn't somebody come several <laughs> several yeah, but it, it's kind of like we don't really know exactly where it's going still. Or I mean, we have a direction, but we don't know. Um, I feel like it's we, we, we're still both young, both the company and ourselves. So we, we kind of like want to see a little bit where, uh, where it's going, I guess. We don't want to sell it too early. Yes, I understand. And of course, because the idea sounds um, like super good and it sounds like everything you guys set up as a goal in the end ends, ends up being made so um i i mean it's it's great what you're doing and it's a great idea and and i'm so happy that sometimes tech stuff comes from europe um and uh, that's <laughs> super cool like um and i'm wondering by having this uh online based platform um and do you have a lot of like uh, for example cyber attacks on the whole thing or is it this an issue ever or 
not yet an our backend developer. He is very, I don't know how to, he's how to phrase this. He's security he's, focused. Yes, and he says, this is NASA security. You never need to worry about anything. But everything is not so, not so secure until uh, until you get hacked, right? Yeah, uh, we, we haven't had any issues so so far, actually. No. Yeah, let's let's hope it stays that way. And mm -hmm. I'm I'm curious now, like um, you have on your website also the the logos of some of the companies that have tried your product, and some of them are uh more famous or at least i know them i don't know if they're more famous and other i haven't heard before uh, mm. but um how it is going within the um within the industry is it like now um before you started as a consultant and um now you have started um like now you switch to you, you switch from the consultancy based business to the product based business so are you do you have a lot of uh, way more clients than before or can you serve way more people or is that number reason i would say the interest is much much higher when we have a product to sell i mean it, it, the demand was quite high when we worked as consultants as well um but you know the hours are limited throughout the day yeah. um, and i believe that or it feels like people are more interested in actually buying a software that they can use as a standalone service themselves without having a mm. loop every time. Yeah, we also have more time now than we did back then because mm. we, like we mentioned, we were both we were students and we were doing the consultancy part. And so so it's 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 definitely more now, but mm. but I think the reason is it's not only the product but also like also, like uh, like uh, traction gives traction, right? So, like yeah. uh, it's easier to get new customers when you already have existing customers. Mm. It's always hardest in the beginning. Yes, and um, also I can imagine that this is um, this way of working for the clients. It's even better than um, having a consultant because they have more control, basically. They have yeah. a digital consultant, and they yeah. and they they feel also having more ownership on the whole process because they feel more like they did it or they actually did it, but yeah. kinda. So yeah. it's a very mm. very tricky mm. situation. Yeah, it's an important point. Yeah, mm. and, and the um and and the in the business model, it's a little bit like Netflix, right? Like you never own the like you pay a monthly i don't know uh payment to get access to the platform or how does it work in that sense we have different business models actually so sometimes we do projects and so if you're a property developer for example you can come to us and say i have this plot i want to use the software once on for my project but i don't want to buy a license for a year for example because I have an urgent need and I need to use it for my project this time. And um, then you can pay and you can use it for the project. And we will also uh, do consultancy support for that, of course. And uh, so that's one way of using it. And if you're an architecture firm or an engineering firm you, and you want to do the projects yourselves, then you can pay a monthly fee for doing it. That's also a very good way of doing it because. Uh yeah you like cover cover both um, businesses so to say and also um, project development it's way more lucrative than architecture so um, this is um, I think it's a it's also in that sense it's very smart the way you did it and um, I'm curious also do you have like an open uh, subscription price on the on the website or is it like every every single customer that ends up in in your um on your website or get in touch with you have to personally discuss the subscription method and price if my question we was discuss clear. It. yes yes it's, yeah. it's clear um so as it is today we discuss it with the, the customer um and we base it on the demands and how many people and how they want to use it and, and so on. 
uh, so we have a dis an initial discussion. So therefore we don't have open practice on the web page yet, but we are planning to release a more generic version of the platform, which will be available for people to, so that they can actually subscribe on the web and use it. Um, but that version is not ready yet and we haven't released it. It will come, but that's the reason why we don't have the yeah, so it, it's, it's like a closed beta, I guess, right now, something, mm -hmm. something similar to that. Uh, so we have, the people that are in the platform have all come to us and and um, and talk to us personally mm. um, and it's also for like make it easier to like um, when we add new features and when we when we fix things then we, we know like the um, we know exactly who's in the platform and we can we have a dialogue with all of them yeah i see um but just for the matter of curiosity um, and somebody that listening might be, you know, wondering um, what is the price range you can have? Let's say, um, I mean, I guess it can be very different because if I'm, I don't know, um, I say a name, Tishman Speyer, which is one of the biggest uh, project developer in the world. And I'm a single freelance architect that wants to, to do several projects or something. But what are, in your experience, the price ranges, if you can share, if it's shareable? We are still uh, discussing it and it, it's not fixed yet. Um, because as you say, it varies a lot if it's a super, super large company, uh, which is normally what we're working with at the moment. And um, that's one case. But then when we have the smaller architecture firm, there's another use case for, for the product. So. Unfortunately, we cannot share yeah, the we, price strategy yeah, we, yet. We, we, we try to take it by on a case-to-case -case, mm. uh, basis. So, so yeah. I, I see. So it's not yet. Um, it's not like a mass uh, product, so to say, because in the, all the it's not like a software. Because the softwares you have, yeah, for example, Autodesk now has this indie software license, which are meant to be for. Mm -hmm uh freelancers and they have the license for for um, for if you want to buy a single license for a normal company and they yeah. have for example for huge companies as you said where you pay per login basically like yeah. a token yeah. so uh okay. i understand but well if anyone is interested has to go and contact you yeah, <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> yeah. yes talk to you um, if you want to know you have to ask <laughs> so um i guess you guys are the what another thing that i was thinking outside of of this whole talk that we have had now about all the technology and the solutions in the business is that uh, you are um the first uh, guests on the podcast that are uh, maybe i don't know um uh, I don't know if successful is the right word, but let's say accomplished because you're doing what you love, combined to different passions to create a product that helps others uh, that are millennials. So you're from the from my generation. And this is makes me <laughs> makes me even happier. And um, you have on your website um, also what I noticed and what I liked is that you have these statements of your um not only uh, goals within the industry but also ethics um mm -hmm. which is um which is very important and one thing that i always um like i have a background my background i'm born in bulgaria which is eastern european country i grew up in italy and now i'm in germany and um, i have this sort of say very uh very wide uh horizon and uh, for example, one of your uh, challenges and that you're tackling is to improve, of course, the build quality on the environmental aspect. Um, and one thing that I, and you're from the country where Greta Thunberg is also from, so she's the <laughs> most iconic, uh, most iconic figure into uh, pointing what is the problem and uh, create awareness, which is good. Uh, and we as designer and architects are the one and together with our clients and the politicians which are in in the in the with the ownership of actually 
doing something for the problem. Uh, so I was thinking, do you think that your also your platform by being so accessible uh, could be also distributed, for example, for um, mitigated prices in areas in the world where um, really it's a matter of um, yeah, really to to get the best out of what people have uh, for the environment. Because I make always this example that uh, in Germany, where I'm now uh, in my situation, it's way easier to have the mindfulness and the economical um, stability to have extra time to think about okay, maybe I should spend one extra euro or extra dollar on this product because it's better for the environment or not to save plastic and so on and on and on. And when you move to a country, what Bulgaria I've experienced in the first place, there are people, for example, they have limited amount of resources and they want just to make their life better because some of them struggles to get by the end of the month. Um, and they would buy, I don't know, the cheap diesel car or whatever it is. So mm. I do, you, is it also like your goal to, in the future, if this, this project and this product gets this wide popularity, do you think this will be also this automatization and this AI will be the tool to give a better product out of resourcefulness in countries that are, for example, less developed? I think it's a yes. yeah. I think that's a brilliant yes. question. Actually, that's a really good question, mm. and I think the answer is definitely yes. Yeah. So what's what's really good about, or the um, <clears throat> yeah, what's really good about software is that it's it's really easy to duplicate. I mean, it's it's hard to do the same thing with a with a car, for example, because the car has an, has a cost to to manufacture, right? Mm. So it's it's hard to like uh, make the pricing strategy. Um, so um, dynamic, but with mm -hmm. the software, it's much easier to do that because um, the more people that, that are able to use something, the more value you can get from it. So uh, I think we're definitely yeah uh, open to to, to thinking in that way. Like yeah, that, yeah, and we want to create as big impact as possible when it comes to environmental impact, etc. So as long as we can create value, we want to do that as much as we can. And is it your is it your platform already? For example, um, has functions relative to the type of construction that the building can have. So I ask that because, for example, I think if um, let's say so, the future of in general we see it now with three D printing and with the technology and the softwares that we get. Uh, it's the future will be this decentralized um so to say production and efficiency so to say i will need uh, a stand for my webcam and i won't um go to i don't know i probably will go to the shop of certain brand and download the file and my 3d printer will be printing it for me and then this is how we'll in yeah this is how we're going to do it probably and i'm thinking in your case your software is so intuitive that it's with these sliders. I, I've never used it, but what I see from the screenshots and the pictures. Mm -hmm. um, do you think mm -hmm. that by inserting parameters, like, I don't know, um, I have available bamboo or I have available a certain amount of wood or I have available um, old metal, I don't know, whatever you have, you can uh, integrate this kind of parameters be beside concrete mm -hmm. and that in the end can generate some sort of construction plan I mean, this is probably a very far away future, but I don't know. Do you think this is, can be also some direction you can might go? Of course. Uh, we don't have it in the platform right now because um, right now we're focusing on like areas, massing strategies, placement, orientation, you know, like very, very early stages. But we have been thinking about how can we bring in the aspect of reuse and recycle aspects into the platform for example so if you have like okay i have this amount of this material and i have this amount of prefabricated walls or whatever we are also thinking about how can we bring in a set of material to see what can we get from it 
Mm. So you kind of specify your resources first and then see what you Yeah, it, it's a super interesting discussion because it also it's also tangent to, to another discussion that we always have mm. about like um, how far you want to push optimization. Like let's say for example that, that you have two different options and one is one is better from from like a material use perspective. You have more um, more chances to use re reuse material in one, but the other one is more energy efficient, for example. Then I mean, oftentimes there are like contradictory parameters or contradictory things in different options that makes it hard to say that this one is uh, objectively better than than the other option. Uh, and there comes like a, um, a really interesting question, like how you how you rank something or what what what, what should be like the um, the best option that the, the platform suggests. And I think our approach to that is to not really um, maybe give so much feedback on what is the best, but rather just like visualize as much data and as much information uh, as possible to give the people that actually makes the decisions, the tools that they need to, to make mm -hmm. good decisions, but, but not making, not actually making the decisions, but just uh, visualizing the impact. Uh, and and proposing different solutions yeah so i mean in one way you can see it as a more as a communication tool rather than a design tool because it's not necessarily the purpose to get the perfect perfect design out of it but you can start seeing trends in terms of data like if we in general do something like this this will happen. We will never get some in this, uh, in this uh, park here, but we will gain a lot of square meters. And very, very similar proposals say the same thing. We will get very shady and not, uh, not sunny and balconies at all, but we, will, we can build a lot. So it's always like you, you, you rank very high on one parameter, but then the consequences of that is that, yes, you will lose something else. So. A really interesting discussion is like what is actually a perfect design what is the best and who think it's the best because if you ask different people with different backgrounds people will say different things yeah and i think it ties nicely with your question as well because i mean if you for example you you, you have a lot of bamboo for example then maybe the option with the, all the bamboo in it is the one that you should pick because that's what you have at town right um, so, so it's also individual to the, to the individual company and project and even person sometimes. Mm. Um, yeah. but, um, yeah, sorry. No, one thing that uh, you make me think, I'm, uh, the, 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 the conversation is very nice because I have imagination, but I have no technical clue about if this could be done or not. But one thing mm -hmm. that um, I'm wondering now is if this platform has at all um, if it's like, uh, as you mentioned before, sort of a mixer where you can play the different tracks or mm -hmm. it has a brain too. And if, if by brain, I mean, if it has an a AI background in it, within it, because um, one thing that we were mentioning now is that, for example, if you integrate an AI within it and um, data can be collected, you can uh, create the principles. So for example, that through the design, uh, and the feedback that uh, the AI has collected uh, it's to tell you, um, uh, like while designing, so to say, I make an example uh, to tell you, okay, if you sacrifice too much of the energy efficiency, you might win a little bit more on cost now, but on the long term, you will lose. Mm. Uh, so mm. to create principles that not only the the it's like as you said there is conflict but the, the platform also tells you your choice has a consequence more or less yes yeah, yeah. so it's about visualizing consequences it's about communication and maybe more about insights rather than perfect design options it's more about seeing trends and realize what happens if i do it like that where I think the AI might come in is to like take take some raw data so sources that might be super hard for humans to comprehend and to um, uh, to understand basically, and to make sense out of that data. So you can you can probably have like intermediate AI to like bring all the data in and give the humans some some things that are easier to to actually work with. Um, 
uh, I mean, it could be it could be anything, but let's say, for example, if you have you have all the data of public transport in the city, for example, that's a lot of data. It's really hard to understand how how like a, a new neighborhood would would uh, interact with with the uh, the existing infrastructure, for example. But so there, I think that's where you where you uh, where an AI actually could do some some really good work because it could help the people to take that data source that all that information and actually make sense out of it and use that to take better decisions but maybe not taking the decisions themselves or itself <laughs> that's maybe pushing it one step too far mm. i see but i think still like you guys are definitely going in the in the right and an interesting um direction and to pull off again a little bit from this whole technical side i'm curious uh it sounds like a lot of a lot of work to to build it up you know to put put it together um how how uh, does your day look nowadays uh how how many hours do you work a day do you have some practices uh, that uh keep you stay i don't know uh healthy or like to do um do you do specific sports uh, or things because it sounds like a lot of uh, mental work and when you're entrepreneurs and business people on the side uh, you have all the mm-hmm. stress of, of clients sales mm-hmm. things like that so how, how does your day look like and do you have some routines that keep you keep your game level up so we, we, we try to be in the office eight hours a day, more or less. Um, we're both very tired in the mornings, to be honest. So it sometimes turns out to be like uh, sometimes six or seven hours in the office. Um, but in general, we, we aim for eight hours. We aim um, for eight hours, but it's not always the same eight hours. No. It depends on <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to have returns, but it, it's, it's hard. Um, but um, yeah, so we try to do that in the office at least eight hours um weekends off but the hard part with running a company is that it's very hard to distinguish between spare time and work because i mean if you are in the shower and if you're like thinking about ideas and you're like oh we can do it like this or maybe like that does that count as spare is that spare time or do i work so it's a really fluffy uh limit uh, or border between working and not working yeah it's, it's blurred lines and, and also mm-hmm. like when, when you actually enjoy what you're doing at work it's also easy that you you start i mean you, you, your work is your hobo, hobby and your your hobby is also your, <laughs> your work in, in a sense so it's easy to but i also think it's really important to have that to distinguish between this is free time this is when i can do whatever i want and mm-hmm. i'm at work and then then i need to focus mm. um, but it is really hard i mean to be to be completely honest i mean it's really hard to switch off and sometimes i wish i just had a button saying like okay please don't think about this anymore i am at home and i don't want to think about it but sometimes it's so hard to just turn off ideas and turn off um turn off right <laughs> but yeah sports it's that's really good we're going to start playing paddle <laughs> which is uh, very exciting um yeah. in, in which city are you guys based gothenburg because i i heard that uh, i don't know if everywhere around sweden or in malmo only uh, zlatan has opened some some paddle centers <laughs> so oh, no. they're, they're everywhere they're everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> It's so popular. Popping up like mushrooms everywhere. Yes. <laughs> literally so you, everywhere and they, literally everyone. They, they're, really they're so popular that the news got uh, and, um, to Italy too. Uh, <laughs> we know about those fields and, and centers. And, and yeah. But you to, to, to mention this blurred line, you say that it's so fluffy. It, it, it's good because it's like, uh, as you said, it your hobby is also your job. So maybe you also the job is not so hard, as if it was not something not pleasurable. Um, and what are the most um, hectic uh, tasks or things that you have to do? Because, for example, I do this podcast, which is fun, and people get to see this talk and conversation. But behind there is so many other tasks that I have to do, 
and not all of them are fun like the the yeah. fun yeah. part is to talk to you uh, what are the most hectic tasks that you didn't know you have to do or that you had to learn to do because within the business there are, i don't know tax return or i don't know i was just going to say report the tax taxes yeah yeah. That's not what we signed up for when we started a startup, but uh, taxes it's are not it. fun. Yeah, it's part of the it. The administration part, but it, sometimes, I mean, when we do the project work, that's quite hectic mm. because then we actually have like pressure on on us, and we need to actually deliver, and we have strict uh, uh, deadlines. So that could be quite hectic sometimes, actually. I, I try to dis distinguish a little bit between like hard, or not hard, but like um, deep work and light work. Mm -hmm. So like answering emails and 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 doing tax reports and like writing stuff sometimes can be seen mm -hmm. as more like light work. It, it's not that it's easier; it's just that it, it 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 doesn't need your deep focus in the same way as when you do coding. And um, I think we're both probably. Probably both of us are like we're quite easily disturbed. So sometimes mm. you need to like give yourself the opportunity or the time to actually have a certain amount of time uh, undisturbed or like where you can actually do some some deep work. And I think that's probably a hard part that that you you don't get those like um, long consecutive uh, time spans to to actually focus so often because there are a lot of stuff happening and. You need to be somewhere, and yeah, a lot of a lot of things. And answer a phone call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, there's always stuff popping up, and I think struggles with like shifting focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So that's, that could be tricky sometimes. <laughs> that's probably the hardest part. <laughs> yes. Do Do you have any productivity methods or productivity tricks to? Because as you said, sometimes things come together like a waterfall. <laughs> and uh, if you try to catch all the drops, you drop all the drops. <laughs> so yes. uh, do you have some, I don't know, method or have you read books on this topic? Uh, or yeah, if you, or if you just- I um... say coffee. <laughs> coffee is the, the short coffee answer. Coffee is the short answer. <laughs> And, and and uh what is called um performance enhancing drugs <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah 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 no we don't do that <laughs> but i also well, coffee it is like, well, coffee at least i mean we, we, have a, sugar. we have a really good to do like we, we use trello for for like scheduling all the things that we need to to mm. do uh, and trello is like a uh, you, you basically we can write tasks and we can assign each other to the tasks so I, I usually assign you to all of it or as right. much as possible same. and she does the same uh, but I also try to think like so it's one dimensional like it's everything you need to do and we, we have like this is what's urgent this is what's a little bit less urgent and this is what's even a little bit less urgent everything is everything usually is urgent. urgent but but try to have like a and both like depending on the size of the task and the um, the um, um, like when the deadline is, mm -hmm. if there is a deadline yeah. uh, and also like the, the amount of time that you think that you will spend on the task. Mm -hmm. um, so you're just trying to keep everything structured as, as far as possible. I guess that's the best uh, advice I can give and coffee. <laughs> it's a great advice. I love how you, how you guys think. <laughs> um, um, I always like to end up the conversation with all the creatives that I have on uh, by collecting this um, tank of inspiration, I like to call it. Uh, so I ask everybody, everybody that are creative and your, in your case, creativity means making this platform and make it work, uh, get into these uh, little roots or a little bit of... Uh, you know, uninspired moments. Um, do you have something that uh, inspires you or has inspired you like um, a book, a movie, activity that you like to do or um, media, I don't know, even podcasts or something that music, what is your um, way of getting inspired again? I always get inspired by, by listening to music. That's my, uh, my answer loud and very like positive music what kind of what kind of uh, what uh, genre genre of music you like or they're mixed 
I'm not sure if I can tell, but <laughs> no, yeah, sure you can tell that it's <laughs> it's bon shampoo. <laughs> you know, that's... It's cool. It's cool. That I like that music yeah. too. Nothing to be ashamed of. <laughs> 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 but that's my answer. I wish I could say something cultural or something like that. But the, the real answer is... Uh, I, I listened to, to 50 Music cent. from uh, 2002. That sounds like good. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if I have a really good answer, actually. I, I, I really enjoy reading, but I, I probably read way less than I, than I, than I think I would like to. Um, I read The Process by Kafka a couple of weeks back. I thought it was a really good book. So that's also a good answer. Um, yeah. Agreed. Well, then, um, thank you very much for for the chat. It's a real a real pleasure to have had the opportunity to talk to you. I'm now a real fan of you guys. I I wish you I wish you all the best, uh, uh, highest success. And uh, when Forbes invites you to talk to you, don't forget to come first to the podcast <laughs> we will the podcast. <laughs> no no you have to first be on the podcast when you become yeah. the hottest um, people in tech and um, yes. and I want to say that everybody who are um, willing to go to get to know you or to contact you I'll put the all the links in the description of this podcast but basically it's the website is parametric.se which it stands for sweden so they can contact you there right yeah for sure yeah and do you have an instagram linkedin something we have all of the social media <laughs> yeah I, I think you can you can uh, find all the links on our website as well um, yeah it's in, in the in the footer of in the footer of the website yeah but in but, general, I think all of our accounts are parametric solutions, sometimes parametric solutions SE for yeah. Sweden. Perfect. And I'll go try request a demo to myself. So for sure. <laughs> welcome. Thank you very much, guys, and have a thank good you evening. So much. Yeah, thank you so much yeah, for having us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. bye.